Good afternoon, all. Good afternoon. Hey, Joe. Uh, hey. Made it back all right, Mike? Oh, yeah. Yeah. How about you? Uh, it was good. I had a good trip. Uh, I, I learned a lot. And I enjoyed, yeah, me too. you know, talking to some, some people. It was good. Yeah, it was good. It was same here. Um, you owe me uh, a shipping mailing address. Because I got to okay. send you a couple books. Okay. I'll get you that. But in yeah. that same vein, um, you didn't get contacted by a, a publishing company called ATP, did you? No. All right. Well, they might reach out to you. Um, they okay. approached they approached me about writing a uh, a textbook for a kind of an intro level class, and I I entertained it, but it just with some of the other things I have cooking, it's just not something I really want to go after. So I yeah. gave them no, your contact information. I love it. You know, no doubt. Okay. So, well. Anyway. Um, uh, yeah, send me your contact information. Just email it to me or text it to me. You know. Okay. I'll, I'll toss. I need to toss those two books in the mail to you. Okay. Awesome. Well, I appreciate that. No problem. And uh, and um, if you don't hear from ATP, they're a good group, by the way. I use their textbooks for my uh, my construction management classes. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're a legitimate. They're they're not as big as like. Um, Taylor and Francis or some of the other yeah. ones. If they don't reach out to you, like in give them a week, um, okay. let me know. And then I will, maybe I'll make a digital introduction. Okay, good. And that's, they, they're called ATP? ATP, yeah, American Technical Publishers or something like that. I'm just making myself a note. Yeah, and they're, um, um, so they they we I talked to them for about an hour on the phone and I really was interested but I mean there's just a couple other things I just can't get to. I I couldn't do a good job in the time frame they wanted yeah no actually but, it's actually would be uh, perfect timing on my part yeah okay well um, I I did I did speak highly of you so they they should they should reach out to you but if they right. don't who knows yeah well I'll uh, I'll keep my eye out for them. Yeah, and the intent uh, is for it not to be like a part 107 prep. It'd be kind of yeah. like. No, it's know. a, I totally get it. Yeah. Uh, Zach, uh, can you make me co-host? Yeah, you should be co-host now. Oh. Okay, okay, I, I could be. It shows in participants that you are, so you should be good. Okay, all right, cool, thank you. Got it. We got a couple of minutes before we'll start up. Well, guys, it's it's two, but let's wait just a couple more minutes, just in case. Um, this was kind of a last uh, or the announcement. I didn't get the announcement until relatively soon, so there might be a few more people logging in. But let's give about another two more minutes.
All right, team, you guys want to get started? Works for me. All right. Yeah, so, let's do it. all right. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So, and I'm going to start off this way. Um, so, I don't know, a month or however long ago, uh, ago when we were having these discussions and Zach said that he was going to be stepping away because for the summertime while he was, um, you know, teaching some courses and, and whatnot. And I, uh, I accepted the mantle of, of taking his role on for at least the next couple of months. Um, I had that discussion, no problem. And then when we were out in Denver, some of you guys were there. Uh, we kind of clarified that a little bit. At least I wanted to kind of drill down, kind of thinking, okay, what, what is it we're doing? You know, what's the point here? And, you know, I, I'm kind of action oriented and goal oriented rather. So I, uh, I sat down with Diana and, and Zach and just kind of identified these five things. Uh, so these five tasks here, these are actually my, uh, my words based off of our discussion. So, so this is, this is kind of the marching orders that, that they kind of gave us over the summer. Uh, I think uh, items one through four are very doable and then kind of starting the foundation or at least getting a good launch pad for number five um, at the end of the summer may be, may be doable as well. So first off, what I ask is, is again, I want to, I'm goal oriented. What are we trying to do here? And the objective here is for this work group is to develop the minimum learning outcomes that a school must provide to join this group what they have to provide and kind of, you know, to join the group, clarifying a little bit, and we had kind of talked about this before, that what are the learning outcomes for a single three-ish credit UAS 101 class, right? So that's my understanding. And I, I, before we even kind of move on, is that kind of what everyone else's understanding is? Do we need to have any kind of discussion about like what, what our goals are before we kind of move forward? Or does that make that's sense? Basically, to what I understand, Joe, on this one. Okay, makes sense to me. Okay, all right. So, what is the minimum that they got to hit? What is the minimum a school, a Clemson, a, a a community college, or whatever needs to do in order to be able to to get in? And when I push back a little bit on this, Diane is like, "So, if they don't do this, if whatever we come up with through this exercise, if a school doesn't have that component to it." So that means they're not ready. They're not ready to join this group and we can provide guidance and assistance, but they need to, they need to incorporate enough of it, at least to get a minimum, be able to get in the group. With that being said, the intent is for this not to be, you know, exclusionary and to create barriers, but we got to have some kind of minimum threshold. All right. So how we are going to accomplish that is we're going to take the, the syllabus spreadsheet that my grad student had made and look at that, look at all the things that all of us are teaching, has us broken down, and then use that just kind of to, in, to kind of inform that discussion. And I've, I've got that spreadsheet, which I'm going to show you here in a minute. Uh, and I've got some numbers and basic, not even statistics, but some numbers to show you. And we can kind of use that and to kind of inform that, that objective. And then number three, uh, once we've got that, what I'd like to do is say, okay, here are the, the top things that everyone says that we that everyone's including in their class. Which ones make sense? Okay, that's fine. We got these handful of things. And then, all right, guys, if we're going to make a 101, the UAS 101, what's missing? What's kind of, and just kind of create some bullet points uh, of what's missing in our, in our class, okay? And then once we've got that, um, based off of the spreadsheet and just some dialogue that we're going to have, we've got to fit that underneath that, that seven, you know, whatever the congressional languages um, items are and fit them underneath that. And of course, we've already have a little bit of work done already in this space, but some of that I think got a little bit too big and we got to kind of look at that and say, okay, what really makes sense under these, under these seven things? And then once we have the learning objectives, once we kind of have said, okay, here's the basic minimum UAS 101 class requirements to get in the group, five is, okay, we're going to start creating modules. Here's some education, Legos, whatever we want to call it. Here's modules that we can either use in and of ourselves or to that program that wants to get in but is missing a piece. We can say, okay, you're missing a piece. Here is the module that you can now incorporate into your class, bring up the spay, and then and then welcome you into the fold. 
Does that, I mean, everything I said so far, does that sound right? Is any objection, any discussion, anything we got to flesh out? We good? Good, good on my side. Okay. Yeah, All right. good, good here. Okay. So I'm going to, so I'm getting rid of um, Diana's email. Um, so what I did, so this is that familiar spreadsheet, right? So this is the Google Docs. Everyone can see my pay, my screen, I'm assuming. But here are all the schools. You guys filled this stuff out. Uh, I went through here and did a little, um, you know, Excel wizardry, and I counted up, you know, how many, how many of these programs said yes to these various different, these, there's 20 items here. You know, about is the FAA trust required, part one or reviewed, blah, blah, blah. There's 20 of these like topics, okay? Um, and then I plunked them down over here. So these are the 20 topics that are right here. I can probably put a number to them, right? But one, two, three, whatever. 20 of these items. And then I, uh, this number over here of the 47 classes that are included in that spreadsheet, this is the number of classes which said yes, that they include that in their course. Uh, now, keep in mind this, you know, you got to weigh this a little bit with a grain of salt because, you know, some classes, you know, some programs have whole certificate programs. So they have one class that's dedicated to part 107. And then you got another class that's dedicated to processing the data. So that first class might check the box and say, yes, we do part 107. But the next class, which is kind of a prerequisite for this other class, they don't cover part 107 because that's not the nature of that class. That's, a, that's the next class. So, I mean, I would, I would encourage us, there are not very many cases like that, but I would encourage us to kind of look at this list from a high level and look at it for themes, like what is what are the main themes that, that we can glean, uh, glean from this. So um, I'll go through it quickly and then I'll kind of tell you what I, what I gleaned out of it, what kind of my impressions of it. Uh, flight proficiency, or excuse me, the flight training component, 29 out of 47 classes included that. Photogrammetry, uh, which included anything, if, they, if my grad students saw the word modeling, mapping, photogrammetry, PIX4D, drone deploy, context capture, any of those words, uh, they included it. Don, I see your hand up. Go ahead, man. Yeah, I was just curious what the color coding was for. I, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll get to okay. that. But that's just getting ahead of you, sorry. My, uh, it, but because you asked, those are some common themes that I think we can maybe squish down together. Like yeah. for specifically the orange, this seems, I mean, again, you asked, but... Uh, it, it seemed to me this is data collection and doing something with the data, right? So this is photogrammetry. That might be important to contractors. That may not, you know, no, if you're a, uh, uh, if you're an, uh, an, an agriculture program, you may not need that, right? So it's just doing something with the data, like photogrammetry down here, uh, videography, thermography, photography, LIDAR, GIS, plant health, those are all doing something with the data. So I'm going to get to that in a minute. I don't think that we can say that, by God, you have to teach multispectral plant health to be in the CTI group. But I think we can probably drop back and say, you know, you need to, you need to be able to do something with the data. Your program can't just be flying around. It's got to be some kind of data collection and doing something with it. Does that make sense, Don? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. All right. And more discussion on that, by the way. Um, you know, but that's that was the logic. Um, collected data was number three. Um, do students need to request ATC Lance authorization for part 107 reviewed, which is uh, different than eight down here? Does your course prepare for part 107 knowledge test? A little bit different. Um, pre post checklist. The trust uh, test, which is actually kind of an interesting discussion that I'm looking forward to having about, you know, what we think is required trust only uh, part 107, you know, if any, either one of them are, are required, you know, I'm interested in that discussion. Uh, but again, going down the list, basic uh, photography, videography, 
Uh, thumbography is number 10. Photography and video editing. So that's kind of more of a software thing. Uh, NIST, Open Test Lane, LIDAR, GIS, Flight Logs. And again, we're starting to go low down the list here. Uh, plant Health, the APSA BPERP certification, uh, thermography, the NIST obstructed and confined lanes, and the building information modeling. So and those ones, uh, no one said yes to those. So um, going back, so... What I kind of saw out of this, and again, not, now I'm, I'm riffing here, guys, so I'm open for discussion here, but what I saw out of this, the big things in terms of major themes is uh, um, a flight proficiency component, um, some kind of rules, which we're going to talk about, about what that means, and then some kind of um, um, uh, you know, and by the way, when I say flight proficiency, I really got to break that out. I should say flight proficiency um, stick skills. So how you move your thumbs and then uh, flight proficiency. God, my typing's terrible. Um, uh, mission operations. So kind of break, that's kind of how I read that. And then regulations. And then I don't know how to phrase this, but, um, you know, doing something with the data, you know, some kind of output. I don't know how you call that. So discussion, guys, what, do you, what, what themes do you see out of this? Again, you know that what we're, what we're going for, what, what kind of things should we say you have to do in order to get into the CTI club? Well, I think uh, uh, just to jump in, sorry, sorry, Don. Uh, I think one, and you you haven't got to it, but it was there. You're talking about the trust. I think the trust has to be like a bare minimum baseline. Have to do it. Have to, or rather, rather, your students have to do it. It has to be integrated into your course somewhere, because I think that's the that's like the the if you don't do that then everything else really just kind of uh, falls falls by the wayside. And, and we can discuss that a little bit more. Thanks for your time, Don, go ahead. Yeah, and, and the other thing that I think is missing from this is, uh, unless I'm just seeing it, is really where and how are drones being used? You know, how, that background piece. So like applications? Yeah, yeah, because you know, a lot of students, they think drones and they only think of one or two uses, not realizing that they're used in industries all over the place. Okay. So I all think right, giving so, people that broad perspective is really vital. So let me make uh, two comments. So one, um, don't disagree at all. I think that's in here. And that, that's, that's gonna be like the next step here. Like once we glean what's out of the syllabus, we need to add to it, and which is what you just did, Don. And, and when we open that discussion up, I, I have a feeling that's good. That list is going to grow pretty, pretty long. Um, but going back to Eugene's point, and we can start here with the discussion. So, um, it, so we'll, I'll phrase it in kind of three different, a couple different questions. Does the group feel that trust is that that you that your students have to pass the trust to get into CTI? The next question would be: Is CTI enough? Like, do they have to prepare for, because trust and part 107 are different. There are some differences in the rules. So do they need to go beyond trust and get into part 107? And then do they need to pass the part 107 exam or at least prepare for it? Are you talking specifically the students or the instructor here? Oh, Just to clarify. Uh, uh, students. These are learning objectives. I okay. would kind of hope the instructor would, but I mean, that's hope, a good point. <laughs> It's not required. Uh, well, so th these are, these are okay, really good point. I would say these are required learning objectives that your program needs to teach your students. Yeah. I, mean, I think I, then, yeah, preparing for the part 107 is one thing. We, we can't, you know, you can prepare a students like crazy. It doesn't mean they're going to pass it, right? You know, another thing you could do, if I may jump into it, uh, going to, to the trust versus 107, but I mean, you can require that in order for them to do this acceptance into this class is that you say, 
you must have a trust or you must have a part 107 just to be a part of it more or less more or less that the let's say another college is wants to get in what we're saying is that you you must already have a 107 preparation you know that might you know you or take eugene's part and say that part of this is that it's a 107 or a trust that you must have you know uh, a, an element or a building block along with this 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 course that we're talking about so now my suggestion is you know we, we need to do that they either either should have a trust or like in, in our in our situation we require uh, and we have preps for 107 so to get into the, even to the first class you, you have to have a 107 so but again this is a threshold of what we're saying that you, that a part of the CTI group is that you must have these modules in place. So I would kind of go along with Eugene and say that you must have at least a minimum of a trust and preferably a 107. Okay. Now, are you talking to even get into the class or are you talking no, to the, the content I'm of the class? To, I'm talking to the, the college who wants to be part of this that they must already have in place to be part of the CTI group, uh, a, a, a either a 107 training or a part 107 uh, or 107 a prep or, or a trust program. But that's, they have to have that in order to be a, a part of the CTI group. So I'm not talking about the student, uh, but in, in a way I am. I'm talking about does this university want to be part of the CTI group? That's that's right. That's what this is. Is one of the requirements that a university must be preparing their students for in order to get into this group. And, and, and Pete, all I'm just saying is is that they must already have that in place. That's one of the elements that they must have. And and to to tack on to what Mike's saying is is if we're, if we're talking about threshold, just to begin, if your university, your college, your, your system doesn't have that, then they're already behind the power curve. I mean, we can, we can debate the, the, the value or, or a disvalue of trust, but the bottom line is the FAA has already approved it. They've got plenty of ways to do it. It's absolutely free, and it provides the students with a basic uh, uh, building block to work from both the regulations and some of the other stuff. If you don't have that, you really don't have much. If you have the 107, then you've, you've eclipsed that. I would yeah. still have our students go through it, even if they had the 107, if no other reason than just a refresher. But I, I see that as, when you talk about thresholds, I think see that as the threshold. And then uh, as, as Don was mentioning, Yes, we can't force them or compel them or, or uh, require them to have the 107, um, uh, uh, the, the, the 107 licensing. But right. if, the, if the goal is to, to have these folks fly drones in the national airspace, then you need to be able to do that safely and legally. The FAA says mm -hmm. right now to do that, you need trust. Uh, if you're going to commercialize it, then you need the 107 and then right. and so on. So, so we're really so, go, going to the Eugene a, a bit is that what we're really saying is that if you as a college, community college, let's say, or any college wants to be a part of the CTI group, you must have these pathways. Either you have a 107 or you, you have a trust part of the curriculum. Now, the question I'd have, if that's agreeable, then, then let's say that a group another college wants to get involved in the CTI and they don't have anything. So shouldn't we then have a module that they could download to, to help them with that curriculum to, to have that in place? Uh, I agree. That's, that's going to be, that's, that's step five, you know, or okay. that's this one right here. Like once we agree on what the module is, that's mm -hmm. going to be a starting to create curriculum. Um, so for what it's worth, guys, this is going to be the subjective opinion side, but my opinion is that I feel that, that trust isn't enough. 
because this is, you know, tr trust is for recreation, right? That's not what we're doing. You know, no one takes a college course. Well, I said nobody. You know, most people take college courses to do something with it, to, to monetize it in some way, part of their part of their work. That's not trust. If you if you do anything with it that is connected to a business, that's part 107. So my opinion, and again, this is open for discussion. If we we say that, you know, again, we can all agree that we can't make people we can't enforce that or require people to make their students take the part 107. But I don't think it's too it's too much of a barrier to the minimum be that they prepare their students for part 107. And that, that's what I'm finding at this college. We had this, we had a discussion uh, last year of this particular topic, and that is can my class can, can a class require them to actually go down to the FAA testing center, pay the 175 bucks or whatever? And the answer that came back is that we can't force them to do it. But what we can do is we can say, go to this class is to prepare you. Right. to do that but yeah. we can't force them uh and it can't be a part of their their grade is to get that remote license but what we can do is prepare them and they have to pass a, a practice exam or something of that sort then that's that's what we're doing here but what, we're, what i'm finding is is that majority of them the reason why they're taking it is to get the remote license right and they they're hidden down there you know what i'm saying so Sounds i think that i think you're right joe i think that what we say is that part of this is that you have to have a preparation, remote pilot license prep uh, class or element. Yeah. I agree. Don, your hands up. Yeah. Can I just play devil's advocate here for a moment? Sure. Um, if we're looking at schools that might be starting from zero, that want to set up a drone program, they may just start with the recreational side. Um, I know when I surveyed all of the colleges in California, all the community colleges specifically, there were several that their only or first drone class was geared just at teaching people some of the basic rules. They weren't going anywhere near the depth of part 107, but that's where they started. And the question I have is, do we want to put a bar at the door for those schools that are just starting? Kind of the training wheels might be the trust level. So, so from, from a community college faculty member, I would say, yes, we want to say they have to have prepared for 107 because most of the, a lot of the community colleges and technical schools that are just starting are putting the recreational side within their workforce development groups, not in their academic side. So having to get the CTI would be that extra step above. Yeah. than just starting out at recreational so from a community as community college and faculty from that side i absolutely think to be part of cti you should have a prepared class for 107. and i think that added right into what melissa is saying is that we're not going to say that hey you don't do that you know we're, we're saying if you want to be a part of this faa cti group that you at least have to go through the preparations for for that so yeah, you right. need to have that extra, you know, information in order to to move into the CTI group. Yeah, yeah. and we're and and we're being, you know, we haven't even defined what you know preparation means. I mean, I guess you know, in our where we're talking is like preparing for the Part One Hundred Seven exam. I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking, but others may interpret that differently. No, no, I I, I think you're you're right. You're you're spot on with just preparing for the exam, whether you take it or not, pass it or not, you're still preparing. Because as you look through the rest of the list, none of that really stands out as recreational. Right, you, that's my point, yeah. That. So yeah, having that baseline of the trust, having that baseline of the 107 being offered at least allows them the option, gives them uh, some flexibility to move into these other areas. Otherwise, you're no, uh, very few people I know are going to invest the money uh, the the uh, uh, subscription fee for Kix 4D just for kicks and grins. It, it's probably just not going to happen. I agree. I don't know. I, agree I don't know you. who's using Pix 4Ds for for kicks and grin. You know, if you're using Pix 4D, it's commercial. 
No yeah. one's using Pix 4D yeah. for fun. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. So can we kind of can we kind of say maybe I'll move some of this stuff down to what you know what we agree. Um, a requirement is uh, to prepare students to take the part 107 knowledge exam. Can we agree to that? Yes, I agree. Okay. I agree. All right, so let's let's tackle something else. Do you think, and again, this is the minimum requirements to get in this group. Do you think that we need to require uh, uh, these schools to teach their students piloting skills? Yes. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, do we want to put any kind of threshold on that? Or, or what does that mean? Well, it, it, to me, it, there's, uh, I think that you build them up from never touching a drone all the way up going to the, the, the B prep or the basic NIST exam. Yeah, the B perp. That, that, that to me is what the federal government NIST program is all about. And that is the basic flight skills that are going to be required for somebody doing, you know, some operations. So I, I would, I would, you know, embrace NIST on the on the B prep uh, as as the the basic threshold that we have to have classes for that. Now let me just throw this out to the group. When Mike says uh, the NIST B perp, does everybody know what that is? Yeah. Okay. I mean, it's it, for for those not willing to say no, they don't know. I'll, I'll throw it out. <laughs> it's <laughs> NIST is a government is a is a government lab. It's under the Department of Commerce. NIST is an acronym for the National Institute of Standards and Testing. I think technology. Um, technology. technology. Okay. Okay. Um, so and and they have a group underneath them that deals in robotics, and they have developed a several. Uh, test lanes and test and, uh, and you've probably seen them they're five gallon buckets they change the two gallon buckets and now they're moving down to like uh, an eight quart bucket they keep changing the test which is a little annoying to be honest with you <laughs> For, I, mean, I got pallets of five gallon buckets i can't use anymore but anyways um they've got a test and they don't tell you what pass is they, 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 they will not, they don't issue certification. They don't tell you how quickly you have to finish it. They don't have to tell you what the score is. You know, you talk to them and they give you some, you know, estimates, but nothing written down. Um, but they do have a test, several tests. Uh, what Mike just mentioned is the BPERP. That is another acronym that stands for the basic proficiency evaluation of remote pilots. That's it. Okay, that one I always struggle with. Give, give two, that guy an A. On that yeah, one. <laughs> there's two P's in that one. I get them mixed up. But um, but anyways, so they've got that, and it was kind of made famous because APSA, another acronym, adopted it and are issuing really the only nationally recognized flight certification. You know, and we use it at Clemson, but not for me anything. I, part of me. It, looking, you know, with a 12 month horizon here says, I agree, Mike, let's just make um, flight proficiencies a requirement. You need to use the BPERP and they need to get to this level. And, and part of me says yes, but the downside with this or the barrier is now you got to be able to have facilities to be able to build that, to store that, to, you know, to, to do that and but on the other yeah. hand joe you know if you're gonna if we're gonna say we want we want these students to do some hands-on anything mm -hmm. you know touch it <laughs> to to know how it operates to know physically what's going to happen when we do certain things you you are in the same bucket meaning that you're still going to take a drone you're going to touch the drone you're going to understand the processes you're going to understand the control surface every, the whole sequence of events so that you can go someplace to to uh, to do to perform these. So I think that by putting this in, it basically says that part of the CTI group is to perform these 
so that we can ensure that there is a safe, it's, it's all about safety. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, the, and we're not asking them to do the advanced stuff or anything else. It's just, and they got the darn things down to where they're small. You can do them into a basketball court for God's sakes. Yeah. So I think, I think the facility is not going to be the, the issue. I think it's just taking a little bit of time, putting something together. And it's a very simple, if you just look at the basic course, it's very simple and low cost. So I don't think it's a, a high threshold. Okay. We're not asking them to get into a hel real helicopter. Yeah. Gotcha. Don, and I think you got your hand up, then Eugene next. Uh, I, I, first off, I absolutely agree. Fl flight training needs to be a part of this. I'm just really reluctant to tie it to a specific exam, um, even though it's, it's a good one, um, just because of the fact that the looking at how many different areas people are teaching drones, if somebody is teaching cinematography, then the, the, the level of you know, flight requ required to to do the the B perp may not be um, what they need. They might need to have a more um, customized uh, type of flight assessment. But this would be minimum, I I would say. And I think you're right, Don. Uh, that if if I'm going into say autonomous flight for surveyors, you know, uh, is it is a bit different. But what this does on the on the basic is that it provides a mechanism to ensure that the student has, has knowledge and has the touch to, to be safe. It's just very big. And by tied it into a standard, that means everybody can, can because even, even today, I have commercial companies here that are adopting this as a standard and minimum requirement for them to even employ somebody, you know, so I think that you're, you're correct that whatever the downstream application to get into, such as you know, inspection uh, wind towers is a really different methodology, but these guys before they even get there should have breezed through and have, the, have that information from ba basic building block for them. That's my the B perp is is pretty easy to be in all candor. Like it is not a difficult test. Uh, Eugene, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to kind of uh, lean into both sides of this at the same time, if it, if it is possible. One, having the standard is going to be important so that everybody has the same standard. But then two, um, B perp. Uh, and I, I went through the, the the NIST training and then became a proctor, and so we we use the B perp. If you don't know, if you don't have a proctor who is there to tell you how this is done, then you can can uh, pencil with this pretty easily and get nothing out of it. Also, if you don't have someone who knows what the functionality is behind the B perp to explain why it is that you're going 10 feet up, 10, 10 feet out, 45 degrees and looking at this, uh, this bucket inside this apparatus, then it becomes even less important uh, for the individual who's taking it and for the school who's supporting it. And then lastly, this is, while yes, you can download the uh, the uh, uh, construction for building the apparatus uh, and you can build your own apparatus, you can build it to scale and you can follow the directions. If you don't have the that next component, which is to have somebody who's uh, either a certified proctor or probably just a certified proctor, then you only have one piece of it. It's like having a, a thermal camera and not knowing how to use it. You have this beeper, but you, you're not, you are not moving to the next level, which is to provide some sort of certification for the people who have passed it. And then Joe, to your point, one thing that you mentioned was uh, the, the, the testing standard. The beeper testing standard across the board has been 10 minutes. And it's the only one that I know of that has that 10 minute limit. How many times do you get to do it before you, you're good? I don't know that there's been uh, any kind of established thing put on that. So that that's just my two cents. Well, I'll, I'll, I want to push back a little bit on one thing, and then I'll let Melissa go. We we need to be careful that NIST and APSA are two different things. Uh, NIST creates the test, and they say go forth. Now they do have kind of an unofficial relationship with APSA, but it's APSA that provides a cert certificate. And I'm not introducing APSA at all. In fact, I'm being very intentionally not using that 
that term. And they're the one that came up with 10 minutes. I mean, yeah, that's okay. kind of the industry standard because they're the industry standard, but uh, you know, we got, you know, we just gotta be kind of, I just, just push back on that. And then uh, Melissa, go ahead. Thank you for that. Yeah, I was just going to say, I, I think we need to keep it the proficiency generic. I mean, we can have modules for NIST and, and other things, but if we don't want to have to rewrite this every time somebody else comes out, whether it's AUVSI with their top operator level two or whatever, absolutely, you know, they, they change something. I mean, we kind of need to keep it generic and proficient. And then the modules is where we can have people pick which way they want to go. I mean, you can write proficiency generically and still achieve it without requiring people to have the NIST and, pro and, and you know, proctors and all that stuff. Because it's a community college level, I can tell you they're not going to have proctors. And so that's going to wipe out a whole section of people who ever could be CTA, CTI. Well, again, and when you so say proctors, we're talking about APSA. And well, we I, I know, but if, if we're going to put in even this, I mean, there are some community colleges that are barely surviving financially to build the course. And as you said, they keep changing it. Um, you know, I think putting it to a specific thing is going to really eliminate a lot of people versus I can have a pro teach proficiency flying without ever using this. Yes, so, well, that's a fair statement. Yes, it is. Uh, can I ask, can I add something to that? Um, so one thing is, is that I agree with Joe is that we shouldn't talk about APSA. That's your certifications, okay? But what we should do is say, you know, using the, the the NIST protocols, okay? And 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 then allow the community college what's, you know, the method to teach that because you got the protocols, you got the methodologies in there and the grading system will be up to the community college. So we, we won't ask the community college to become an APSA, that we're gonna leave that out because NIST doesn't even talk about, they don't certify, they just say they work with ASTM and to to establish these standards, and and so I think that one the NIST protocols should be should be added, but we should not talk about um, what's what's the the what's passed, what's fail. You know that should be up to the community college. I think we just have the protocols in there to have them get to fly that is 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 well enough to bring into the to the CTI group then allow the college to go beyond that if they want to. So, so maybe what, if I'm hearing you, Mike, maybe what the, um, maybe what we do is we say uh, that the community college need to have, we leave it generic, but they need to have some kind of standardized or a methodology for assessing flight proficiency, that they need to have flight proficiency and they have to have a, a methodology for how they assess it. And then, yeah. period. Yes, this, and, this and is great, that, but yes. but also is that you know reference the the NIST standards, the NIST protocols. We got we have to say something in there on the NIST, don't we? That's up for. I mean, that's up for grabs. Yeah. It, it is. I mean, I I agree with you. Like I use it. Like I and I like it because it, it's different than AUVSI and all this because yeah. it's a federal agency. You know, that's right. It, it's different. It is different, and and I and I've been through top and all that. It's a mess, right? You know, I I don't even want to touch that, but I but I think that this is a standard uh, that we can use in, in a community college, of which we are one, and that it's 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 very it's structured, it's it's easy to apply, it's easy to integrate, and it gives me a methodology to evaluate the performance of the individuals, and I'm the one who who grades them accordingly. So, so we're not telling the colleges to how to grade these and how to certify them. We're just giving them a standard mechanism so that no matter whether we're in Alabama or in Seattle, Washington, we're following this, the same uh, methodologies. And I think that's important here. Don, you've had your hand up for a while, sorry. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, I definitely understand what you're saying, but again, I, in, in the interest of um, being, um, more inclusive, I'm going to disagree. I mean, we can reference the NIST test, 
But I will tell you, um, I have my students fly an obstacle course, PVC pipe and pool noodles. It's amazing. I can guarantee you my students are flying a more rigorous, um, they have to demonstrate more rigorous of flight ability without the NIST test. I don't give that. I have my own that I have created. Um, so I am really reluctant to, um, to mandate that somebody has to do this. If we want to give it as a, an example of a, a type of flight proficiency testing, that's fine. But I guess part of the reason I'm being argumentative today is I'm trying to be more inclusive. The more that we are talking here, the more we're making it a more exclusive club. You got to do- be, We'd be kicking you out then. Pardon? What was that we'd, be, we'd be kicking you out. <laughs> Fine. Feel free. I'll make a lot of noise. Uh, but I'm really pushing. You know, the idea yeah. is we want to bring more schools into the fold right. to show them the right way of doing things. If we put up a big set of roadblocks right off the bat, that's counterproductive for what yeah. we're trying to do. And I think, I think telling them that they need to include a NIST style test, I think is going to scare people off telling them you need to do some sort of flight proficiency uh, evaluation. And by the way, here's one example. I think that's okay. I'm just trying to really keep us on the, 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 the more inclusive side. Yeah, your, your point's taken. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah. Point is taken. I agree. I agree. John. Melissa? Your point's well taken. Melissa, go ahead. I, I was just going to say, I agree. Absolutely. Um, I have no problem with standards and protocols and we don't use like well, I use NIST in the beginning, but we also have an obstacle course that my students probably could outfly most NIST people because I don't like NIST, but that's from cyber side. So I think exam using it as an example is great, but as a required test, it would take us out of CTI also. All right, so I'm thinking of a way of phrasing this. Um, so, Joe, uh, like, I'm going to kind of use an example. So, like, we kind of have a, a training that we do on the wind side that is a worldwide recognized um, certification called GWO. So, um, some of you might have heard it sometimes, but it's just a basic safety training course. Now, they set the standards of like what you need to include, but they don't tell you how you want to teach it. I feel like if we are going to give these schools the ability and flexibility to teach it themselves and how they want to teach it, we shouldn't be exclusive, like they're saying, talking about the NIST program. If they want to include it in their curriculum and that's how they want to teach it, fine. But also what you kind of said, Joe, I feel like we need to have a guideline on proficiency of flying, but not something that's maybe exclusive to some schools. Okay, well, how I mean, so including requiring, including flight proficiency, but also requiring some kind of measurable flight assessment. Is that a compromise? Yes, I, I think that's, that's a, that's a good compromise. Global wind. Yeah. Organization. Thank you for that. I, um, I like it. Then, Joe. I like it. Yeah. Let me throw one more thing out there just to stir the pot a little bit more. Do we want to require a minimum number of hours that they're behind the sticks? I do. I agree with that. Yes. That's yeah. I want to bring up too. We should say a minimum of uh, two hours of flight time uh, in association with the risk assessment program. Uh, and then let the college determine the proficiency of that two hour flight time. Uh, and again, I'm going to stir the pot by disagreeing because the amount of flight time students get is going to be very much dependent on the budget the school has, how many units they have, how many students in a class. And, and I think if we start to specify hard numbers, again, you're going to be turning people away because there are schools that are offering, they, you, know, you, you can teach somebody to fly pretty well. Some, a lot of it depends on their innate ability, of course. Um, but I think trying to specify a minimum number is, is going to be limiting people. You think it should be zero like that? We just that if they can pass a proficiency exam, who cares how long they've been behind the sticks? If they can fly it, I get some students who have played video games for years and they can come out and they can pass the NIST test or my obstacle course the first time they touch a drone. I've got others that spend way more than that number of hours and, and they still can't fly worth beans. So I think stick time is not a really good indicator. 
I think that it, it's based more on the proficiency, uh, proficiency than on a, a, a specific number. But so we're, we're not really dictating what proficiency is because that was the benefit of NIST because there's a little bit of quality control there. I right. could develop a proficiency test that's literally you take the drone up 10 feet and you come down 10 feet. Pass, right? I mean, so I I, I don't know that I, I'm playing devil's advocate, but I don't even know what the position I'm on right now, to be honest with you. Uh, but if you if you require two hours, you know, at a minimum, you're going to have two hours worth of experience or whatever that number is, right? Well, Joe, I, I think I see what you're what you're getting at, which which in theory, which doesn't really exist, the reasonable person who doesn't really exist makes sense. Uh, but I can share with you that the, the sheriff's associate, the uh, sheriff's office, has some minimum flight requirements, but they had to up those and start using an enterprise version of uh, air data because their pilots would go out, put it up in the air go have a cup of tea, and then land it. And did they fly for, for the hours? Well, yeah, they did, but they didn't go anywhere. And so the, the same thing could be said there with giving the minimum uh, amount of hours. I know what the, I think I know what the intent is. Uh, hands, behind, hands on the sticks, the, the drone going somewhere, you doing something. But it's, I think it's almost tantamount to the driver's test. You get behind the wheel of the driver's test, you either can, or you can't, uh, and 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 that's really what it comes down to. So, uh, Don, uh, on on this point, I, I think I I think I'm leaning towards your 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 corner. Yay! Actually, you know, right. and I agree with with Don in regards to you know I think the, the concept of defining hard hours is, but 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 again, I go back to what Joe just saying, uh, and that was. The re that's the reason why I have NIST is a, is a defined standard of, you know, I know exactly what is going on and they, they and I'm not going to pass them until they, you know, effectively do this now. So I'm, I'm, I'm kind of torn in one way. I, I don't want to see a, a hard fast hour, but uh, on the other hand, we got to make sure that they have, or whoever comes into the program has a, a very good flight proficiency uh, exam that can that can define that. So maybe we say nothing at this point. I don't know. You know or, yeah, yeah, I mean, there's nothing that says we can't do a recommendation that students have two hours of stick time or whatever. But I think to require that for admission to CTI, again, is closing the door on people. Yeah, I, I don't know about recommendation. Cause I mean, it, it sounds nice, but when we're, when we're, when we're doing standards and either you, you're doing this or you don't doing this you know we you know but we can create when we create modules by the way if someone's missing this here's a module and by the it's the NIST right and here's the scoring and you know I have more rigid uh scoring parameters than than the 80 percent in 10 minutes you know that that's a that's a d in my class you know you, you don't fail but that's a d you need to do a lot better than that to get an a for your beeper so uh, what, what do you say we just leave it? We, okay, I threw it out there so I can retract the, the, the comment. <laughs> well, can, can I ask, since, since Diana is here now, can I ask her a question? Hi, Diana. Um, this goes to one of the uh, part of the conversation we're having, because what we're doing, obviously, is trying to figure out what the standards are um, in part for a school to, um, to enter CTI. Um, I'm pushing for a wider net, um, being more inclusive, knowing that once schools are in, we can help guide them, mentor them, et cetera. Um, but is that something that that the FAA has a, a, a point of view on? Are, are you looking to um, you know, be slightly more exclusive? That's a bad word, but you kind of know what I mean with that? Well, and I think we've actually done a little the opposite. I think originally following the air traffic CTI, which is very small and very detailed and a lot of requirements to be, to be met, Congress for this UAS CTI was all about workforce development. And that's kind of all over the place, right? Uh, so when we initially 
you know, when we had those words in the beginning that scared a lot of schools off because it was like, you have to, you know, have a minor, you have to have a, a certificate program, you know, all the things. And so um, we just kind of took it upon ourselves to open that up. But I still think the mentoring part, I really like that idea because there are, and, and we've kind of done that, you know, uh, Donald, I think you were even, uh, you and maybe Kenya now were early on with the video starting and maintaining a drone program. We pushed that out um, to schools, but, and I give them your names too. All, if, you, if there's a school from your area, anywhere near you reaches out and they're trying to build a program, we do connect them with you. And hopefully you have heard from some of them, but um, but I think a more formal kind of program might be actually a really great idea. And we even are getting ready to have a conversation with uh, Justine Hollingshead over at NC State about, you know, how we can, it, how should we go about really making sure that, you know, young women, and they may not be young, I went back to school really old, <laughs> but women are comfortable and want to get involved you know, um, is all part of the whole DEI and A. Right. And and I guess, and, and Joe, this this is to, uh, to you and to the whole group. I think the conversation has been straying where we've been talking more about what does it take to get into the CTI? I don't think that's what we should be doing. I think we should be talking about what should a minimum introductory drone course look like, whether the school gets uh, allowed into the CTI or not is I don't think it's purview of this group. I think that our conversation has strayed from our purpose. Well, I, I'm I'm open to to change, but I, I kind of my perspective is that those are similar. We're we're designing the criteria for an entry level UAS 101 class. If a university doesn't provide that, I don't know that they're ready to be in CTI. So my, maybe I'm viewing it the wrong way. Well, and that's the question yeah. I have is- what I does... agree. I agree on that one. I do think that, you know, the whole purpose of this group and getting together is to have that entry level, oh. have that, here you go, let me hand it to you. And what we at the FA do not do is provide curriculum, right? So that's where, you know, this is a beautiful thing. But D Diana, what would you consider to be the minimum a school would need to, tour, to teach in order to be qualified to be admitted into the CTI? I usually look at like, the, you know, it's part 107 prep and I realize they can get that <laughs> side of, you know, they, the, 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 the piece that you go and take the test, but also that the field ops, you know, being out and actually hands-on and doing um, is usually what we really push. And we do also, when we accept that maybe only a couple courses, we say, work towards that certification. And then the next thing, you know, one of the, and I brought this up before in this group, one of the other um, training objectives and goals was to have um, dual credit, you know, like you're working with high schools to make that happen. That's actually in the language, but we kind of ignored that one because we knew it was going to be hard enough not hard enough, but, you know, so that's really kind of what we went. Do you have a part 107? What we want to not have happen, and we've had schools request to participate, that they ask, um, they say we have a, you know, ground uh, ground school, and we mention drones in that course. And it's like, no, it's got to be true drone UAS courses. It has to meet these seven, eight items, right? Right, right. Yep. And again, we don't know what, I mean, we're still defining what those are. But, and again, but, it was Congress who threw them out there, and I really don't know who from, I'm sure someone within the FAA provided that language to whoever, you know, but I don't know who that was. It was, you know, 2018 Reauthorization Act, and I had no idea to me that, you know, so that I could go back and say, hey, what did you mean by this? <laughs> who knows? Um, Cody, your hands up, and guys, we're actually getting close to our time, so let's, let's have Cody uh, talk through it. And then maybe we can define where we're where we're leaving, so that when we have our next meeting, we know where to pick this this back up. So, Cody, go ahead. Yeah, I just I think it kind of goes back to points that Don and Diana made about what is this course? What do we want with this course? Because if we want this course to be educational and curriculum and involve curriculum to further, you know, educate people. 
then we probably need to be more inclusive. But if we're trying to do what workforce development wants and push more people out into industry and employ people, then I feel like you're Lines are probably going to be a little bit more. We're dealing that with that right now. Workforce development. They want a shorter program for our technical programs, and we are trying to push back on it because we don't think that it's adequate training to give them a month or two months or three months and send out into the workforce. So it's kind of where work we want this curriculum to do. Do we really want to educate people and and progress that, or are we just trying to push them out into the workforce? Okay, uh, Cody, you cut in and out the out of there, but I think we I think we got the the gist of it's a balance between inclusivity and which I know I don't like that word either, but um, and then being able to 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 require the course be rigorous enough that they can do something with it and go do it for a commercial application. It's a little bit of a balance. All right. Um, so let me kind of summarize where we're at now and because we need to kind of know where we're at now so we can pick things up at the next meeting here. But what we've agreed to so far, Diana, we, we spent some deliberation on what you just kind of announced earlier that we got to prepare for the part 107, not trust, but prepare for part 107. There does need to be a flight proficiency component to it uh, and it does need to be formally assessed stop we're not going to talk through NIST or anything else at this point but just formally assessed um we didn't really pick up on the different like define what proficiency means we've been talking about stick control but i think that there does need to be um i think i mean let, let me let me ask this question as a way of knowing where we pick things back up for our next meeting would it be fair to say that the next thing that we need to discuss is um, what needs to be included in terms of the flight operations piece of that? Things like requesting lance and um, logs and you know the other part of mission operations besides stick control. Is that a good place for us to pick up next time? Oh yeah, pre yeah, pre-flight safety consideration, you know, risk management, all the all those things. I agree. Yes, that's I agree. Vitally important. All right, so I don't, <laughs> I don't. Even, it's hard to 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 organize this thing here. So um, next time, um, you're doing great, and we appreciate you, Joe. Oh yeah, no, no worry. What do we, what's the Don? You, you're gonna you're good at this. What's what, what's the good phrase? What's the good verbiage for describing what we just said without a bunch of examples? How about just additional flight operation considerations? Uh, okay, additional. And that kind of, that covers everything from pre-flight to risk assessment to uh, basic post-flight considerations. All right, so this is where we're picking up. All right. I feel like I should. Post-flight is so incredibly important. And I know you all know this, this audience, but, you know, coming from a government, local government, where we shared, <laughs> we shared drones, we shared everything. And, you know, if the person prior to you did not go in and just, you know, follow up with what worked well, what didn't, if the batteries needed charging, all that kind of thing. And it happened all the time. And it really set you back on your operations due to the past one. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So next is when are we meeting next, Diana? How, how do what's how are we doing that? We have we have those dates. I I've, I've got them. In fact, they're already. Um, Zach has already got them with the. What am I trying to say? The Zoom meeting. <laughs> so I have them flagged. And let me go back and see when they are. That's right. I'm sorry. My brain was a little slow. I gave you some dates, right? I knew I was available. Okay. All That's right. all right. That's all right. We're on it. And all right. And then, so you've got those and then you'll push those out to the group with yes. the outlook. Sooner and the than this one. My apologies between <laughs> exponential and um, the New Jersey right before that, man. And then I brought my mom home. <laughs> That's a whole other. A so, whole other hey, thing. sometimes with a smaller group, things happen faster. Yeah. Spontaneity. <laughs> so, 
And we may have disagreed today, but I think we still like each other. So that's good. Well, I don't think that we disagree. I mean, uh, I mean, no, it was good discussion. No, I mean, I, I mean, I, I might have presented positions, but sometimes I don't even know that I was fully sold on the positions I was presenting. <laughs> sometimes it's good to have a little discussion back and forth on it. Diana, do you know if uh, Zach, um, I, in one of the last meetings I was in, he was going to flesh out whether or not they, he was able to get the uh, ATSM, uh, ASTM uh, standards, um, and make them available. You, so Eugene, he did. Okay. He brought it. No, he brought it up. But the other, I'm not sure about. But I will follow up with him on that. Did he? All right. Let me look and see. He may have. Is it not in the folder? I, I didn't see it in the folder. Okay. But Eugene, if you need like a bootleg copy of something just for your own personal use, just let me know what you need. I can. I can. See, I think that's where the path that we headed down. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and all I was doing really was I, I'm I guess I'm more nosy and curious than I am uh, interested. Uh, and I think once I get my nosy curiosity solved, then I'm happy. I do think he may have dropped it in the chat when we met, but I'll go back and look and I'll get get that out to everybody. Thank you Thank so you. much. Okay, well that's it for now. Um, we're gonna we'll, we'll pick it back up next time uh, with additional flight operation considerations, and we'll start defining what what those minimum things are. Rock and roll. Sounds All good. Right. All right, guys. Thanks. Anything else before we wrap up? There's a million. Oh, I'm just looking. There's a million things in the chat, guys. So if you post the things in the chat, sorry, I didn't read a single one of them. <laughs> yeah, so the dates are June 21st and July 26th okay. for the upcoming. And then one other, I do have, um, and yeah, I think this is old though. For some reason, he was sending me the, the ASTM um, for the UAS maintenance technician. That may have been for something else. Never mind. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, great. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I, I I know I was the author of those dates, but I don't have them on my calendar. So when you send those out, I'll definitely accept. <laughs> accept them because you you you'll be in charge. Yeah, so. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Hi, right, guys. Thank Diana, you. Can I have your ear for thanks, just a guys. moment? Absolutely.